today, uh, besides our lectionary text today, is another important day in the church that we celebrate in the Christian calendar. Does anybody know what that is? What is today uh, in the, on the Christian calendar? Anybody? Trinity. Trinity Sunday. Today is Trinity Sunday. And I would like for someone to stand up and explain the Trinity. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. I'm not going to try that either. Uh, because here's what I find. We, we can come up with all kinds of metaphors and uh, stories. And they may explain part of the Trinity, but they all fall short. Because you really can't explain God. And, you know, when you think you've got God figured out, you know, I, I've, I've often said that when I got out of Bible college, I thought I had it all figured out. And I found out that I didn't. And, you know, because you can't put God in a box. You can't explain God. You, you know, all these things that, you know, I spent three years in, in Bible college in what was called systematic theology, going through all kinds of theological doctrines, uh, pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and uh, also the theology uh, to talk about God. And so, Jesus in this passage, instead of trying to explain it, we're just going to talk about what He did in this passage. And also the fact that uh, Jesus represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, these are three, right? But they're one. Now, if you understand that, good. I don't. But I'm, I'm thankful for that. So, what I'm going to do is just walk us through this passage today. It's already been read. Uh, but the story today is from Matthew's Gospel, and it is the, what's known as the Great Commission. That is not a term that was used here in the Bible, but it was a term that was given later, the Great Commission. And so we'll look at that. And so it begins, first of all, Matthew is full of life. But sometimes it falls short of being as dramatic as I would like for him to be. And we'll talk about that. But he begins uh, in chapter 28 and verse 16, and he says, Now the eleven disciples. So already, before we even get started, we find an interesting thing. Eleven disciples. Wait a minute, I thought there were twelve. All through the gospel. He talks about the twelve. Jesus chose the twelve. And the twelve did this. And the twelve did that. And the twelve went here and there. And now it says there are eleven. And so we have a hint already of what's going on. That there's brokenness in our world. That one of the disciples are no longer with them. And it's a picture, really, of the brokenness that they experienced and that we experience without God leading our way. We see brokenness throughout our world today, don't we? In a sense, we're all broken, really. We're all flawed. Uh, I, I was called up to a room the other day to a young man, and I went in, and I could tell that he wanted to talk. You know, it wasn't just a quick prayer and, and leave. It was... I could tell he really needed to, to talk. And so I said, may I have a seat? And he said, yes. And before I even, uh, he got anything out, he began to cry. And he said, I said, what can I do for you? And he said, I, I want to change my life. He said, I've allowed drugs and everything that I, in my life to just, you know, just the devil to come in and destroy my life. And I almost died. I almost died, and God has given me another chance, and I don't want to. I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to give my life to the Lord. And as we sat there, I could tell that he was, you know, really sincere. And I said to him, you know, this is the first day, of the rest of your life. This is a, a time to make that commitment. But I want to know. I want you to know, you need to make some changes in your life. One is the kind of people you've been hanging out with. I said, those are not the kind of people you want to hang around. And he said, well, I know. I understand that. He said, but, he said, preacher, everybody where I live, in my community, everybody I know are on drugs. 
I don't know anybody in my community that are not, are not on drugs or affected by drugs. He said a lot of them is on meth or heroin, but they're all on drugs. And it just gives you a picture of the brokenness that we see, not just in other parts of the world, in New York, but right here in our own backyard. This was Floyd County, but it's in Pike County too. Everywhere we turn today, we see people whose lives are affected and their families are affected and being destroyed. And we see a broken world. You turn on the TV and you see a broken world. That song we sung earlier, you know, as, as we're reminded of what's going on in our world. When we see all those thousands of people marching, they're not just marching. Now, some of them may be opportunists out there just trying to find something to uh, trouble to get into, but not all of them. Not all of them. Some of them have legitimate gripes and hurts. And I, I like what... Uh, they said, uh, I think it was Asbury shared a, a post that said, there is no racism in the kingdom of God. And it's true. It's true. But just the fact that we have things like this shows us that we live in a broken world. A world that's uh, tainted by sin. And I believe in original sin. Not everybody does. But I believe that when Adam f fell, you know, that sin's been passed down. That we're all born into sin. And, you know, we, it's easy for us to point our fingers and say, you know, that person needs Jesus and that person needs Jesus. But we all need Jesus. And we're all broken. And we find that in the very first of this, that there were 11 disciples. But then it goes on to say that the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Where did they go? To Galilee. Why? That's... Going back home, basically. Why did they go back home? Well, it wasn't because they were just simply giving up at this point. They were going back home because they were instructed to go back home. They were appointed to do this. And there's a little bit of hope in that. That even after all that's happened with them, and even after the, uh, the death of Jesus and all of that that happened, that they're going by His instructions, and they're going back home, and they're following the Lord. They're disciples, and the word disciple really in the Greek means a pupil or a follower. So we're a pupils of, of Christ, and we're following Him. And that's what they're doing. They're simply going back home because, not because they were given up, but because this is what Jesus told them to do. And then it says, when they saw him. <laughs> now, here's, a, here's an example of Matthew who is not one for a lot of drama. Matthew was not one for drama. Uh, you know, Matthew simply says, when they saw him. Saw who? Saw the resurrected Lord. This is Jesus who had died, who's now on a mountain, and they're on this mountain, and here's the resurrected Lord standing right in front of them. And you would have thought that there would have been more to his, uh, to his story than when they saw him. I mean, you would expect some uh, background music, you know, to crescendo. And you would expect some kind of dramatic uh, event and to talk about this, after all, John at least tells us, you know, that when they saw the Lord, you know, there was a splash and, and uh, the, 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 the creaking of the oars as they're trying to get back to, to see him and all of that. But not Matthew. Matthew simply says that when they saw him, they saw the resurrected Lord. And here he is right in front of them. Jesus, the resurrected Lord. But what happened when they saw him? It says that they worshiped him. What else would you do when you see a resurrected Lord? You worship, right? I mean, that's what they did. I mean, they got out the guitars and the drums and they lifted their hands and they sang to God and they praised God from whom all blessings flow, right? Well, not exactly. 
not exactly. It says that they worshipped him, but some what? Some doubted. Wait a minute. The resurrected Lord standing on the mountain with them, and some doubted. And he doesn't, Matthew doesn't say what they doubted. Did they doubt themselves? Did they doubt him? Did they doubt what was happening at that moment? What were they doubting? I don't know, but it doesn't say, but they doubted. And yet, sometimes I think that's part of what we do too. And, and you know, I think of the time when Jesus comes to the disciples on the water. And he walks upon the water, and there's a great storm. And he tells, uh, you know, at that moment, uh, Peter wants to come to him. And he said, Come on, Peter, come unto me and walk on, come on. Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to walk toward Jesus, to where Jesus was. And then the Bible says that looking out at the wind, he begins to sink. And he cries out to the Lord, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches down his hands and pulls him out of that watery grave. And he says to him, Peter, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? I wonder how many times the Lord has thought the same thing about you and I. In the midst of God doing something great in our world, why do we doubt? Why do we ever doubt God? But yet we do. And I want to tell you something the disciples did. And they're up on that mountain seeing the resurrected Lord face to face. And sometimes when we worship, we have doubts as well. And you may be sitting there thinking, you know, nobody knows the doubts that I have, or the, sometimes the struggles that I have, or the, uh, just the non-understanding I have. Nobody, if they don't really know what I'm going through, but I want you to know that God can handle your doubts. He can handle your anger. He can handle your frustrations and whatever you bring Him. You say, you don't know what I've been through. No, I don't. But I know this, that God, that you can bring those things to God. You can tell those things to God. Some, it said... They worshipped Him. All of them worshipped Him, but some doubted. But they still worshipped. And so, even though we may have doubts sometimes, that should not keep us from worshipping God. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. And then Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus makes it very plain. God has given me all the authority of the universe, and therefore I have the authority to command you to do whatever. I could command, he said one time, that these stones be turned into bread. I could command legions of angels to leave heaven and come down and get me. Jesus says, I have all authority. And it reminds me as we go back to a day, you know, Matthew is always reflecting back, I think, sometimes. And we think of the time upon the mount, another mountain, when Moses stood and God spoke from a burning bush. And he said, I am that great I am. I am the God of Abraham, Jacob, and of Isaac. And that same God who spoke through that fiery burning bush is the same God who was speaking through Jesus. Through Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triune God represented there on that day. Don't understand it, but I'm so thankful for that. And so they assembled. It says that uh, Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And then here it is, verse 19. Go therefore in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There you have it. The triune God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we baptize often, as He taught us, 
We baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When I anoint people with oil at the hospital or wherever, I often do it in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he says, go therefore. That's our theme for today. I mean, now that he's said, I've got all authority in heaven and earth, what comes next? There, go therefore. Go therefore. Go, you go, I go, we all go. Well, where do we go? Well, he says, make disciples of all nations. And so that could be also called Gentiles, but we're to go into all the world. And what are we to do? Make disciples. And the interesting thing here is that Jesus isn't telling, telling us, as often misunderstood, to be soul winners. He's not telling us to go out and save the world. I can't save anybody. You all have heard my story uh, one time about, I think it was Dwight L. Moody, D. L. Moody, the great preacher, who one day was walking down the street and a guy stumbles out of a bar and uh, out of his mind and says to Mr. Moody, he said, you're Mr. Moody. He said, yeah. He said, I'm one of your converts. And he said, you look like one of my converts. <laughs> well, the truth is, I can't save anybody. God hasn't called us to save anyone. He said to go and to make disciples. And there's a difference. You see, the saving and the soul, the people that will be saved will come as a result of us going. And as a result of us making disciples. And so our job is to make disciples. What do we do when we make disciples? Well, he says right here, he tells us that. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. What have I, he commanded us? He commanded the, them to go, right, and to make disciples. To be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So what do we do? We go. And we make disciples, and as we're doing that, we're teaching them to do the same thing. But the job is not ours to, to save people. The Bible says in Acts that God added to the church such as should be saved. But here's what I find, that as I'm going, wherever God leads me, that there's people out there that God is working in their lives that I can share my story with, like the young man I shared about. You know, if you have to force somebody to, to pray, then they're not <laughs> ready to pray. But we go and we make disciples of all nations, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so, he, he says that we're to go and make disciples. And a disciple, as I mentioned earlier, is a learner. It's a pupil. And we're learning together. And as we're learning and we're sharing, others will hopefully want to know what we know and to, to learn what we have learned. And others will see something in us that they will say to us, you know what? I want what you have. Would you share with me what you know? And we can do that. We can simply share our story with them. Go, therefore. Now, there's people who believe that this was only a message to the apostles. That it wasn't intended for us. That this was part of the old kingdom thing and it had nothing to do with us. But I want you to understand that Jesus says to them that they are to go and make disciples and to teach those disciples what they have been taught. And those disciples are to teach the next disciples what they have been taught. It's our job as a church. It's our job as parents. It's our job as Christians to disciple and to teach. And that doesn't end. Not only that, if the, if the Great Commission was only to those 11 people standing there, it was an impossible task. How were they to going to share the gospel to the whole world? Only 11 people. No way. But what happens is that once we share that with someone else and, you know, someone else shares it with someone else and we continue to do that, the message gets heard. That's why I think it's important for us to share about our church, 
If you have Facebook, share our services with others. Maybe someone else will hear something that they haven't heard before. Share that with others. Share that and share people that you have a church. that Invite them to church. That's part of making disciples. And you know, you don't necessarily have to lead them, but you can invite them. And some of you have done that. Some of you are sitting here today because somebody else did that. Thankful for that. Thankful for people who led the way and who shared with us the truth. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. As they stood upon that mountain, it must have been a wonderful event. And I read this verse, I was reminded this morning of a time many years ago as a young preacher going through my own struggles at that time. And we were traveling through and I went to a place in Mount Airy, North Carolina, a place called Pilot Mountain. Anybody been there? Pilot Mountain. It's, it's on the show, Andy Griffith, he calls it Mount Pilot. Uh, it's in that area, but you drive up four or five miles, and then you can walk up to these overlooks. And it was, you know, a beautiful place and a beautiful time. And I remember when I went there, there were all kinds of people around us. And I think I had on a shirt or something that day because it, it, about, uh, I, I think I was going to Bible college at the time, and so, struck up a conversation with someone who was a Christian. And I, th I think we shared some, I shared some of the things I was going through. And he said, well, let's just pray. Here on this beautiful mountain, we begin to pray. And it was a sacred moment. And as, when I looked up and as he finished a prayer, no one else was around but us. <laughs> Everyone else had left, I guess. But it was a sacred moment with God. And all of us have those mountaintop experiences in our life where we can look back and say, oh, hopefully we do, where we can say, you know, I remember the day I was baptized, what it felt like. I remember the day when I, I was lost and Jesus came into my soul. Or, or I remember the day when, when I, when I f had a friend that just talked to me about the troubles I was having, and I felt the peace of God come over me. Or I remember when I was at my wit's end and I didn't know I could make another step. And somehow, some way, God gave me the strength to go through that. Those are sacred moments in our lives that we must never take for granted. But here's the thing we have to remember. Jesus is always teaching us to go. This is where we get fed. This is where we get inspired. But we can't stay within these walls. And we understand that it's outside these walls where ministry really happens. And for the next few weeks, I want to kind of expound on that a little bit. That we want to hear the people and see the people and love the people. We walk outside these doors to go to a world that's hurting and that's dying. And we have a message of hope to share today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, today... I pray, God, that you'd forgive us of our sins. I thank you, God, for Jesus who died upon the cross. And God, because of that today, we have access to this grace of God. We can stand upon the mountain with God. We know we live in a broken world today, and we are broken. But we thank you for your grace and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so, as the acolyte comes forward today, we get ready to take the light of Christ into our community. Here's the message, and here's the benediction. To the graduates, go therefore. To each and every one of us, go therefore. To the whole world, make disciples and teaching them to observe all that He's commanded us. Amen.